everyone. Welcome to Timberlake. We invite you to stand and sing with us. We're going to sing about the greatness of God. Sing truth about how he's so faithful. So sing with us this morning. Come and let us worship our King. Come and let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. God, no matter the odds, the 
outcome is always the same. The words on the pages, promise you made us, still have the final say. You will make a way.
Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are holy. God, we acknowledge that you are, are powerful and you are mighty. But God, not only are you powerful, you're also present. And it's humbling to acknowledge that the creator of the universe knows our name and knows our story and wants to be in relationship with us. And so God, we're just thankful for that. We're thankful for that reality, that you are great and you are also good. And God, may we experience your presence today as we choose to open our hearts and open our minds to you. We thank you and we love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake. You are here on Bad Daylight Savings Sunday. And so way to go. As a reward, there's donuts in the lobby. And so congratulations. Hello as well to all my friends joining us online for you. Maybe a donut emoji in the chat is all we have for you, but thanks for joining us as well. Well, hey, as you came in this weekend, you received a program. Uh, if you're new around here, if this is one of your first few weekends, there's a Connect card. Uh, there's also a QR code in the back of the seat. We'd love to help you get connected and plugged in here at Timberlake. Uh, there's also a Easter insert. Easter is just around the corner, just a few weeks away. It's an incredible experience here at Timberlake. I hope you're planning on joining us if you're in town as well. I hope you have an opportunity to invite a friend. Uh, we would love 
love that. And if you're able to, you can serve on Easter at one of our services. We have services on Friday, Saturday, and then four on Sunday. Just make note, it's different than our normal service times on a normal weekend. And so you can fill this out and then take it to the Connect Center or drop it in one of the, uh, the black boxes on the back of the auditorium. Uh, well, we're also going to receive an offering. If you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake, your generosity makes a huge difference. You can set that up through our app or through our website. Usually we highlight uh, some of the ways that your generosity is making a difference in our local and global missions partners around the world. This weekend, you're going to see uh, just one of the ways that your generosity makes a difference uh, right here uh, at our church uh, through our student ministries and the camps that they just had recently. And so do me a favor before you sit down, find a couple people near you, say hello, introduce yourself, and then check out this video. God's doing through the next generation of our church. I can tell the hands are still waking up this morning as well as the rest of your body, but that's okay. I'm glad you're here. My name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I'm excited. This weekend, we're kicking off a brand new series, Picture Perfect Family, the Picture Perfect Family that you get on a Christmas card, the Christmas fa Perfect Family that you love to hate. Let's be honest, it's just the ones that are just so perfectly put together. And as a communicator, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about at a different church. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about at a church that my family doesn't attend. Because I can go to a different church and I'll throw up a beautiful picture of my family and everyone says, wow, they're so perfect. I'm like, they really are. My kids always listen, it's so great. And they never get a chance to meet them. But you guys get a chance to meet my family. They're floating around the lobbies. Uh, in fact, maybe some of you, I drop my kids off at school with your kids, and so you see my daughters with like a half-in ponytail, half of their teeth brushed, some toothpaste still on their shirt, and you're thinking, man, that guy's a mess. What is he doing? Why is he teaching this series? And, I, and what makes it even harder is here at Timberlake, I'm not doing this to boost your ego, but I walk through the lobby and it just seems like your families have it all together. Feels like no one's ever fought before, no one's ever raised their voice. The loudest you ever raise your voice is singing right here in worship. And that's the only time you ever do. And it just looks great. It looks like somebody shook a, a, a frame at a store and the family fell out. Like it's just the perfect family that's a stock photo. And I don't want to call out anyone in particular, but I was going back and forth, and I'm just gonna do it. There's one family at this church, and I just gotta call them out. They're obnoxious. They walk around, they seem better than everybody, they're scoffing at the commoners, they just have this superiority complex. Have you ever seen this family walking around the church before? Uh, it's like, it's a joke. They just make everybody feel bad. This guy gets up and talks about how close he is to Jesus every week. It's exhausting. And for all of us, we have different measures and metrics of how we measure up to other people. And as we get the opportunity to talk about families this week and what family means to each of us, here's what I know to be true. Each of us have a different definition of what family looks like based on where we were raised, how we were raised, and what our season of life is today. We have a beautifully multi-generational church, and what that means is that for some of you, uh, you're looking forward to what family could mean. It's an exciting season, and so this series, you're gonna kind of plan and prepare and set all the ideals and get things together of what could come when it comes to family. For some of you, you're in the middle of it, 
you're smack dab in the middle of raising kids and so you have the nuclear family that we all think about. For some of you, it's a little less traditional and it doesn't look perfect. You don't have mom and dad and 2.5 kids and a dog at home and the white picket fence. And so as you lean into this series, you're kind of wondering how do I apply this even though my family doesn't look necessarily like a lot of other families. For some of you, you're past the family stage and you get to be fun uncle, maybe you get to be fun grandparent, maybe great grandparent, and you get to figure out what it looks like to have family dynamics in a new season. And I don't wanna be naive. I know there's some people in the room when family comes up, it's a sore topic. You're already planning to skip the next two weeks as we talk about family more because what you've been trying to do is avoid your family. You've pulled back because it didn't go well. And the people who were supposed to raise you and nurture you, they didn't do that. And so you have an aversion to what family could look like. And regardless of what your definition of family is and what season you're in, I believe God wants to speak through this series some ways that we can maximize the potential of our family. This thing that at the end of our life will end up being one of the most important things we ever navigate. And so we think it's important. So we're gonna take the next few weeks and talk about it. And I wanna start with really this speech that's given in the first half of our Bibles. In the Old Testament, it's from this great leader named Joshua. He gets to the end of his life, and he's done some pretty incredible things. He's led the nation of Israel uh, that had just come out of captivity in Egypt. They've wandered the desert for a long time. He actually leads them into the land God had promised them. He's a military leader. He's convincing. He follows God. He gets to the very end of his life, And we see recorded this speech that he gave. I wanna take one fraction of it and walk through it today because I think it speaks volumes to our family. And you, you may have even heard some of it. Here's what it says in the book of Joshua. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether it's the gods of your ancestors that who served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land we're living in today. But... As for me and my household, well, we will serve the Lord. You have a lot of options in what you serve, but for me and my household, Joshua is saying, we wanna be about serving the Lord. And at the end of my life, that's what I hope my legacy leads to. And you may have heard that last part, that last sentence. You may have seen that on a sign at TJ Maxx or Home Goods. Maybe you've seen that cross-stitched at your grandma's house somewhere with a dove next to it and a little cross, and it's this beautiful little sentiment. It's an interesting idea, though, before we get to the end, which seems kind of church cliche, that of course we're gonna serve the Lord, but for the front end of it, it got me thinking. If I'm being honest, as for me and my household, how do I finish the end of that? Like, for example, for me and my household, as for us, we drink Coke, not Pepsi, right? Like God intended. And as for me and my household, we set the temperature of our home to 64 degrees. It's what God promised. And some of you, I get it, I go to your homes, it's at 72. And Microsoft stock is ripping, but guys, come on. Be thoughtful. I mean, that is just, it's too hot. You're sweltering. It's uncomfortable. The Lord intended, right in that 64 to 67 degrees, if you're in there, you're in God's will. It's what it is. As for me in my household, we watch TV shows and movies with the captions on. Anybody else? Where are my captions people? Yes, God's people. It doesn't matter. You're thinking, oh, do you watch a lot of international films of movies you don't know the language? No. English, it doesn't matter. I watch all of them with closed captions on. That's what we do in our household. And I know there's a lot of silly ones for you. You might be thinking, as for me and my household, we ski, we don't snowboard. For some of you, you're thinking, for me and my household, we vote for fill in the blank, whatever that might be for you. We each have different things. And as much as the superficial ones can be easy to notice, even amongst ourselves and between our friends, I wonder if we dig a little bit deeper what some of the honest answers would be. As for me and my household, we avoid conflict more than we manage it. As for me and my household, we never apologize. As for me and my household, we fight until someone cries. As for me and my household, you fill in the blank. Success is the biggest priority. I wonder what it looks like for each and every one of us as we start to navigate. Obviously, with the ideal out there for many of us that we would serve the Lord. But how do we actually do that? 
How do we play that out in a way where we may not be recognized that for that right now in this season? I used to always tell this illustration when I travel and speak. It was one of my favorite illustrations. I would talk about Wallace, Idaho. It was a small little mining town in northern Idaho. Uh, it, it really exploded when they found silver mines nearby. They started mining silver. This place exploded, and as the silver dried up, so did the town. And so little Wallace, Idaho is this quaint little place that nobody ever visited. But that all changed. In 1996, they filmed the blockbuster movie Dante's Peak in Wallace, Idaho. In fact, my family lived not too far away and we heard about it, so we went to the filming and it was exciting. This town was a buzz. And so if you went to Wallace, Idaho today, you hear all about Pierce Brosnan, Mr. 007. I mean, look at that smolder, people. I mean, this guy was there. He visited Wallace, Idaho. So every shop you go into has all these things about Dante's Peak, which I know many of us haven't seen but it's still the thing that they hold on to as the most exciting thing that they have. So I would always end this story talking about what are you known for? Are people uh, aware of your faith? Do they know it from a distance the same way that Wallace Idaho shouts Dante's Peak? Are you known for that? And one time I'm speaking at a different church and I can't forget, it was right down here on the right side, there was an older gentleman who as soon as I brought up Wallace looked startled, physically startled. And he leaned back, he was confused, and I, and I recognized it, but I just kept going with the story. The story crushed. Everybody fell in love with Jesus. It was awesome. It was so good. And after service got done, this guy made a V-line for me, and he goes, that is not where I thought you were going when you were talking about Wallace, Idaho. And I'm like, why? What, what's going on? He goes, I grew up nearby, and when I was a kid, Wallace, Idaho was known because it had the largest brothel in the Pacific Northwest. It was the hub of prostitution. I mean, this place was debauchery central. Before Vegas was it, it was Wallace, Idaho. That's where people went. I mean, it was, it was Sin City. And so I, I, he was thinking, where are you gonna talk about prostitution in a church? Like, what are you thinking? And right there in that moment evaporated my perfect illustration of being known for something. But it got replaced with an incredible illustration about rebranding. And... Uh, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, think about it, think about it. Wallace, Idaho, for me, meant nothing but Dante's Peak. But for someone just a little bit older, it meant something completely different, which proves one point, that we are one generation away from a complete rebrand. And I wonder for you, come on, if you're honest, you may be known for something today. You might be known for something that you're not proud of. But I'm curious, based on this series, could we be just one gener generation away from changing the story of your family can we be just one generation away from everyone associating your family, not with the thing that you're trying to get away from, but the thing that maybe God is leading you towards? Could your family be maybe up for a rebrand? And I think it can maybe start with us personally. So for this week, I'm gonna fly at 30,000 feet, and I wanna talk a little bit about how we navigate our family. In the weeks to come, Pastor Dave's gonna talk about parenting, we're gonna talk about marriage, we're gonna talk about a lot of things, but today, I wanna talk about our family as a general and whatever your role is within it. So here's what I wanna do, how to navigate a rebrand for your family. The first one is this, don't let your family live on leftovers. Don't let your family live on leftovers. Anyone here leftovers people? You enjoy the taste of microwave? Yeah, you love it. You like normal food but drier? Like that's, that's what you guys like? I don't know what it is about me, I, I do not like leftovers. And I know what you're thinking, Lance is so wasteful. That's so prideful. That's your, you, you fancy yourself superior to leftovers? Like, yeah, I have sin in my life, and that's okay. And, and I just don't really mess around with leftovers. The one exception, we all know it. We're all thinking the one exception, pizza. It's the one thing that somehow, through God's will, gets maybe better when reheated in a microwave. But for all of us, we know leftovers have their place. And leftovers are convenient, that's what we love about it. It's convenient. You have what you already have. You don't have to cook anything. I'm not dirtying a lot of dishes. In fact, I can just prepare a leftover and it'll be great. But your family isn't looking for a relationship of convenience from you. They're not looking for that. And though every once in a while I get life happens and life gets busy, for all of us we're gonna have to operate in convenience sometimes. But I wonder, is your family operating solely off of your leftovers 
Think about it from any role. Obviously, most naturally, we think of parents. For parents, are you providing what little energy you have left for your kids, or are you making them a priority? For, for husbands and wives, is your spouse getting your leftovers? And I know you're plating it well, and I know you add a little garnish, but they know. They know it's your leftovers. If you're here today and, and you're a child, whether you're a teenage kid or you are uh, an adult child, your parents know if you're giving them your leftovers, if you're just giving them whatever you have left. And I wonder, for the people that are most important in our life, if maybe we could begin to prioritize something more than just the leftovers, something more than just what we happen to have out of convenience. In fact, can we just level for a moment, just in all honesty, can we stop being surprised that the people in our life have needs? Can we stop being surprised? Come on, come on. Can we stop being surprised that the people in our lives need something from us, that they have needs and they have desires and they want something from you? Sometimes I'll get home and what I'm not surprised by is that my kids run up to me and they climb on me and they jump on me and then they have attitude and then they make demands. They do all these things that I can't be surprised by. I can't be surprised by the fact that when I get home at some point that evening, my wife is gonna wanna debrief her day. And I love that. And I can be frustrated and I can be tired, but for each and every one of us, we can't be surprised when the people around us have needs. In fact, 1 Peter talks about it this way. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. And if you're raising young kids, you know exactly what I mean by fiery trials. If you have a teenager in the room, you know exactly what I mean by fiery trials. Don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Come on, your family wants something more than just your leftovers. And I know it might sound challenging, and I know it'll take a reorganization of your time, effort, and energy, but I wonder, if, if you're honest, what that could look like for you. I tried to wrap it up in a consinct, uh, consinct way, and here's what I, I thought of uh, for this next point, is don't confuse what you do first or longest with your day as the primary thing in your day. Just, just hold on for a second. Don't, don't confuse what you do first which makes, takes your energy first. Maybe you wake up before everyone else is and you go to work and that's great, or you have long work hours. Don't, don't confuse the things that you do first or longest with the primary things of your life because sometimes I think it's most convenient to do that and so we make the assumption they should know I'm tired. They should know I've had a long day. Don't you understand how stressful my job is right now? Sweetie, I told you this season is challenging. For all the CPAs in the room, it's tax season. We get it, we know it's exhausting, but your family can't live off a complete diet of leftovers. That we have to begin to navigate this in a way that sometimes can be challenging, but ultimately serves our family in the best way possible. The second thing is this. You have to win in your unique role. You have a unique role within your family, regardless of what the dynamic is, but you have a unique role within any family unit. And you have to win in your unique role. And again, when I talk about things like leftovers and winning your unique role, you're like, yeah, you don't understand my pace of life. You don't understand. And I may not. I may not totally understand all the things that you're going through. And so if I gave you this little Britney Spears microphone and you had a chance to tell everybody what was going on for you, we'd all probably agree that you're busy, that you have a lot going on. In fact, sometimes it can feel like we're spinning a lot of plates and I know we use that phrase a lot, but it's actually an old circus term. This is where it originated. And uh, these guys would actually spin plates. They'd begin one at a time to add plates on these sticks, and they'd keep spinning them. And the excitement is what? What's the excitement in this whole thing? The excitement then is that eventually one of them might fall. And so you look at it, and someone's spinning plates, and you're thinking, there's no way they can add another one. And they do, and they start to move more and more, and maybe you've become addicted to the idea that people are so impressed by how many plates that you can spin. That you love when people look at you, they think, man, they have so much going on. We walk through the lobby of even church, and people ask, how are you? You say, so busy, so busy. Man, oh, exhausted, but you know, God is good. You know, just spinning, spinning my plates. And this, this can get daunting, but at some point, your family, you're thinking, my family actually looks like this. Like this is, this is what my family looks like. My kids up here looking all pretty, a foot in my face and a lot of pain just holding the family together. That's what you feel like. And you're, everyone's spinning plates and you have the circus act going, but at some point, it feels like something's gonna miss. In my family, we have little kids. I have a five-year-old and a four-year-old. And uh, this is what's crazy. We actually have two versions of plates at my house. 
One of them in the kid's plate. Anybody else got some kid's plates? Like, it's resilient. It's pretty much a Frisbee turned upside down. And, uh, and these plates are bulletproof. I mean, this is incredible technology that they have. And so my kids can tear these up. There's, in fact, there's knife marks everywhere on these things. Because some reason we give our kids knives. We're just trying to raise them up. And, and, uh, and, and, and these things are resilient and they're incredible. So a lot of times we'll hand our kids these ones. But my kids are getting older. And so all the time they want grown-up plates. You know what I mean? They want the grown-up plates that everyone else has. And I let my kids walk like kids do with these. They'll start walking around, throwing it around, doing whatever. But when they walk with a grown-up plate, you better believe. We tell them, death grip, two hands, one foot in front of the other. You walk slowly and you pay attention. Why? There's more at stake. This one, if they spill, yeah, we'll have a mess to clean up. There's not that big of a mess. We know if they break this, not only is it more valuable, it's more expensive, but ultimately it takes more time to replace and as you're spinning plates in your life, I wonder if we, just in the hurried pace, we begin to confuse which is which. We start to spin plates, and we think the same urgency goes for this as it does for this. We start to think to ourselves that, yes, this is just as important as maybe my family is. And for many of you, you begin to spin, and you begin to spin, and it isn't till you start to see a breaking point that you start to realize that maybe the wrong plate fell. That maybe, just maybe, when this plate falls, there's really no consequence. But for all of us, we might have had that moment in our lives where maybe we even saw it coming or it caught us by surprise. But you had a plate that was pretty valuable. You had a relationship with your spouse, maybe with your kids, maybe with a grandparent or a friend that you would call family and and you saw the plate spinning, and you figured, I'll get to them when I can. And if they knew, they know it's a busy season for me. They know what's going on. And as much as it's complicated or daunting, the plate <laughs> fell. And you thought to yourself, it didn't break. It didn't break so I can do it again. It didn't break so on the next time you begin to get addicted to the idea that the plate, well, nothing's going to happen. There's going to be no consequence. There's going to be no frustration in this. And yeah, okay, I think they're valued the same. So they're not. The plate falls and it breaks. And for each and every one of us, we look at the broken plate and we think to ourselves, that wasn't supposed to happen. And so we start to tell a story on why it wasn't my fault. We start to tell a story on what I should have done better, but I just didn't have the bandwidth to do. So maybe today, if we can catch nothing else, could today be a wake-up call that even though you're spinning a lot of plates, some are more valuable than others? And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take the time to maybe break down what those could be for you, but I know you're smart enough that God might be revealing to you what those plates are right now. That God might be putting on your heart the person that you need to reach out to, that you need to mend a fence with, that you need to lead the way in reconciliation because you know it's teetering. And you can keep spinning it and spinning it and spinning it, but at some point, we need to steward it more than spin it. This is a harsh verse that we see in 1 Timothy. It says this, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Pretty strong words that we see from the Apostle Paul as he talks about how we're supposed to navigate our family and maybe on the ranking order where they're supposed to come for our life. I was asked a question years ago, and I've never forgotten it. They asked me to do this exercise, and uh, if you're like me, anytime somebody who's a speaker asks me to do an exercise, I always say, like, man, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna take time when I get home and take out a journal and light some candles and play worship music and do this exercise. But for some reason, I did. And uh, the exercise was simply this, to write down and answer the questions, what are the things that only you can do? What are the things that only you can do? And uh, I began to wrestle with it and uh, I get it, we all fill a lot of roles and responsibilities in our life, and so I began to, to write things down and write things down and write things down, and I showed it to a friend, and uh, they were honest enough, and they actually cared about me enough to, to be straightforward, and they said, there's a, there's a lot of things on this list that other people can do, but maybe they can't do as well as you, so you think you have to do it. There's a lot of things on the list, think about it, that you can do better than the average bear, and so you think to yourself, this is the thing that only I can do. But to be honest, there's very few things in my life that only I can do. 
Only one person can be Winter's dad, it's me. Only one person could be Capri's dad, that's me. Only one person better be my wife's husband. That's me. And I wonder what that starts to look like for you. And what it does is it quickly starts to put into perspective what's plates are droppable. Even though there might be pain, there might be consequence, it might be frustrating, but what plates are really irreplaceable. And for those of you that, if you're honest, think, okay, that's a, that's a neat illustration for somebody else, but I've already dropped a lot of plates in my life, I truly believe that through the work of Jesus Christ, we can begin to bring reconciliation that we didn't think was possible. And there's hope for your relationships. Next one is this. We have to set a clear example. We have to set a clear example. Barna Research came out with a study recently that uh, Christians have 80% more theology that they know than they practice. Think about that. Christians know 80% more things about God than they actually put into practice in their life. And we're all tempted to do this. We're all tempted to think that what we know is actually what, what happens in our life or how things play out for each of us. But I think we know that that's not necessarily the case. That for all of us, even with the best intentions, our kids don't necessarily listen to the things that we say. They watch what we do. Your spouse doesn't respect you for the things that you believe. They respect you for the actions that you take. Think about this. Grandparents, grandparents, grandparents. Your family isn't gonna respect you for the lectures that you give. They're gonna respect you for the habits that you keep. They're gonna know more of what they see than, than what you say. And so for each of us, we're faced with this challenging idea of what do we do when we don't necessarily feel like we want to model things well. And we have to ask these questions when it comes to each and every one of our households. Uh, what's important to us? And one easy question to ask when to figure out what that actually is, is what gets celebrated in your house? There's probably great things like good grades, good grades, doing your chores, good behavior, being kind, not hitting. All those things get celebrated in our homes, but what else? What other things that are God things get celebrated in your home. And I can think about it like character traits, and uh, the Bible actually speaks to these. In Galatians chapter five, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, which are things that, a, that show up in a follower of Jesus' life that's discernible to others. So maybe these are things that should be celebrated in your home. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, also seen as patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What if these were the things that got celebrated in your family? Because you know this to be true in business and the same thing is true in your family, that the things that we celebrate ultimately be the things that, the, that turn into culture. So think about it this way, what gets rewarded gets repeated and what gets repeated turns into culture. That same thing happens to any business that you're a part of, it also happens to your family. The things that get rewarded turn into the culture and expectation. So we reward a lot of great things, but I wonder if we reward the things of God, reward the things that God might have for us. Think about it this way. The best families are built through imitation, not information. The best families are built through imitation, not information. And what does that require of you? A lot. It requires a lot of you. It requires uh, you to think about it like a long-term investment. My dad explained long-term investments to me when I was a kid. Uh, he had his investment portfolio in the stock market, and he, he told us when we were really young that he used to check it all the time. And my mom could always tell when things are going well or not in the stock market based on how my dad is. She didn't have to look at the report because he would be up or down. You know what I'm talking about? And so he would get excited when things are doing well. He would be disparaged when things are going poorly. And eventually, she just told him, hey, at some point, you're not gonna cash in any of these anytime soon, so why look? Why give yourself the frustration? You're trying to time the market so well and it just gets so complicated, it's ultimately pretty frustrating. In the same way that people spend decades of their life trying to research and time the market, we also try and time our relationships with our family. We think, okay, 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 I'm gonna teach them a great lesson today. And today they're gonna be ready to listen, I'm gonna give them this great lesson and then I'm gonna walk away and this one's gonna stick with them forever. But unfortunately, it's really hard for us to time our parenting. My parents will even come to me today and say, hey, remember when we taught you that? I go, no. What do, you, what do you remember from us? Well, I remember this one random anecdote or story. They're like, that? That of all the things, that's what you walked away with from how we parent? And for each and every one of us, instead of trying to time 
when we release things. Like, you can't come home on a stressful day of work and say, hey kids, ignore all of my behavior today, okay? I'm feeling a little irritated, I'm a little bit irritable, don't, don't tuck this one away unless you wanna unpack it in therapy one day. Just wait, spring break, just notice everything I do on the beaches of Hawaii when we're in spring break. Like, just notice all those things and all the character traits I bring to the table then, but you can't time it that way. And so for each of us, what we're looking for in any one of our relationships is compounding interest. We're looking for a steady, consistent investment, and those steady and consistent investments will happen in the great seasons and the challenging ones, but will ultimately have dividends. Again, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, writing to the church in Philippi, says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. We're great with the first part. Everybody, hey, listen to what I do, the things that I teach, you, things you've heard me say. But he realizes more than that. Ultimately, you're gonna do the things you've seen me do. Go ahead and put those things into practice. And we live a life that's worth imitating. We live a life that's worth noticing. I think we get something more than success. Success is really our normal legacy or our normal metric, but legacy becomes something bigger. I, I wrote it down this way in your notes. Success is measured by what you do. Legacy is measured by what others do in imitation of you. So it leads me to my last point. If you wanna rebrand your family, you need to focus on an eternal legacy. Maybe a faith legacy. Something that God would put in your life. A little while back, I uh, attended a funeral for an old coworker of mine. And uh, we didn't know each other super well, but I went to his funeral and uh, it's amazing what memorial services will do to help you put things into perspective. It was phenomenal. He had friends and family members come up and start to reveal portions of his life that I didn't know about. He was incredibly successful at Microsoft and I knew that, but what was Interesting that I didn't know is the way he got to Microsoft is that Bill Gates personally invited him to help lead up one of the first marketing teams that Microsoft ever had. Wow, that's, that's really impressive. And he had this 20 year legacy of incredible success. He had friends come up and tell that he was an avid golfer, which I'm like, oh man of God, I knew I liked this guy, that's great. And they talked about all these incredible golf trips. They showed pictures of him in Scotland with his friends on these iconic courses. I also learned that he was a foodie and he loved food. And so all these places they traveled and played golf, he found the best restaurants. And I'm like, man, that is the kind of life that I wanna live. That's incredible. Like this is the kind of stuff that I wanna be able to tell. And then, then his kids got up. They started to talk about how much they respected their dad, how much they loved him. And they started to tell a story that might be similar to your story. The fact that he didn't grow up in church. He didn't actually grow up following Jesus. It wasn't until later in life that he became warm to the idea of God. And then he kind of became a church person. And then ultimately he became a follower of Jesus. And they told story after story of how they looked up to their dad and they hoped to follow in his example of how he followed Jesus. And I saw his wife come up, brokenhearted, disappointed, but telling stories of how much she respected her husband. She loved and cared for, how, how she just felt celebrated time after time, how she felt cared for, how he led the family in this incredible legacy of following God. And it really put into perspective for me which plates are plastic, which plates are really fragile. I want to take golf trips. I want to eat at great restaurants. But I also don't want to give my family the leftovers. I want to do incredible things and have fun stories to tell. But I also know what role is only one that I can do, and I want to win at it. So I wonder today for you, for me, as we read Joshua maybe one more time, we can start to think through what's going to be the priority for my life. I can't answer that for you. Here's the reality. Even if you choose not to answer it, you're gonna live it one way or another. Here's what it says. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then, well, decide. Choose for yourself this day whom you'll serve. Because you're gonna be serving somebody. Whether it's the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, the gods of the Amorites, well, in the land you're living, could just be the things that everyone else celebrates. 
They're good things. They're, they're probably noble things that everyone else around you celebrates. Or you could say something like Joshua did. But for me and my family, it, it may not make sense to everybody else. For my household, we will serve the Lord. It might be complicated and won't be perfect, but I'm gonna try. And I think that's the opportunity invitation we have today. For some of you, you may feel like I am in dire need of a rebrand. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray and see Jesus work in a way that he promised to work, to restore things that are broken, to bring hope to situations that are hopeless, to bring vision and wisdom to those who would seek to follow him. So today, would you do me a favor? Would you just bow your head and close your eyes? I'd love to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we know that the topic of family is really complicated. We know the topic of family comes with a lot of hurts, frustrations, and disappointments. So for every person in this room, I pray today hope. I pray a sense of restored vision, courage, and tenacity. I get that they're tired, but God, where people are in here are fatigued and feel like giving up, they feel like their efforts have been fruitless, would you restore in them fresh vision? Would you give them a, just this breath of life to know that you are for them and not against them? God, would you remind us that what stands on the other side of our efforts is maybe a rebranded legacy, a legacy away from the things that everybody else would celebrate, and maybe we could lead a family known for people that love you, that serve you, that don't always get it perfect, but nonetheless, God, we trust you. So Heavenly Father, I pray for every person in this room. Would you give them hope? Would you give them peace? Would you give them vision for their incredible families? God, we know it is a privilege to steward our role, regardless of what it is. So bless us in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's stand and let's worship together. front that would love to pray with you. Otherwise, that is our service today. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.
Good morning, everyone. I invite you to stand and sing with us. We're going to sing about God's greatness, His faithfulness in our lives.
Let's pray. God, we acknowledge that you are holy, that you are mighty, that you are powerful, and you're also present. And God, it's a humbling reality to realize that the creator of the universe The all-powerful God knows our name and knows our story and wants to be in relationship with us. And so we thank you for that today. And that reality changes everything. It changes how we live. It changes how we feel about ourselves. And so, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you want to be with us and that you want relationship with us. And, God, I just pray for all my friends who are joining us that we would experience your presence this morning. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake, and welcome on Bad Daylight Savings Weekend. You are here. As a reward, there's donuts in the lobby, uh, just to make up for the hour loss of sleep last night. And for those of you who chose to wear your pajamas and join us online, we are glad that you are with us as well. Uh, when you came in, you received a program. Inside, there's a, there's a Connect card and a QR code in the seat back in front of you. If you're new around here and want to get connected, uh, we'd love to get to know you and help you get plugged in uh, here at Timberlake. There's also an Easter insert. Easter is just around the corner, just a few weeks away. It's an incredible experience here at Timberlake. If you're in town, I hope you're planning on joining us. I hope you've also had an opportunity maybe to invite a friend as well. And then if you're able to, we would love for you to serve at one of the services. You can fill this out and uh, drop it off at the Connect Center uh, or in one of the the black drop boxes at the back of the auditorium uh, as well. Just note, we have services Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but Sunday times are different than a normal weekend, so make sure to take note of that. Uh, We're also gonna receive an offering if you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake. Your generosity makes a huge difference. You can give uh, through our app, uh, through our website, or in the black drop boxes in the back of the auditorium uh, as well. Usually you get to see uh, a way that your generosity is making a difference through one of our local or global uh, partners in missions around the world. This weekend you're gonna see uh, in our church uh, how your generosity is making a difference uh, through our next generation, through our student ministries, and what's been happening over the last few weeks uh, in their camps. And so uh, that's gonna be a lot of fun. Before we do that, though, find somebody near you, say hello, introduce yourself, and then you can have a seat. Love it. Can we be excited about what God is doing in our next generation ministries? It's incredible to see. And I agree with you, that does look way more fun than what we do. So I, I know what you're thinking, and I agree with it. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here. And my name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we're kicking off a brand new series this week called Picture Perfect Family. Picture perfect family, and it sounds quaint on paper. It sounds like one of those things we all aspire to, but it's really challenging to do. And, and if I'm just gonna be honest, right up front, this is a way more fun series to talk in at a different church. Like, to be honest, this is way more fun when I can get on a plane, go to a different church, and say, guys, let me throw up a picture of my beautiful family when their hair is all done, everyone looks put together, and no one's ever fought before, and they're like, wow, your family looks perfect. And I go, they really are, they are, they're perfect. But unfortunately, when I do a series like this here, you see my family, you meet my family. Some of you, you go to school with maybe my kids, and so you see me drop off my daughter with a blown out ponytail and toothpaste running down her face, and clothes from yesterday, and you're thinking, that is not a picture-perfect family. So why is he teaching on this? And it's even more intimidating, to be honest, as I look out at a crowd like this, 
of good looking, put together people with your east side prowess and academics and education and tenacity and all the things, you parade through the lobby and it looks like you guys have never even raised your voice before. Like it's just, you've never, like other than in worship, that's the loudest you ever get is during the songs in here. And it's just like you've never fought, you don't understand what I'm going through. And I didn't wanna make it personal, but I will. There's one family at this church that they walk around and they are so smug and condescending and their kids have it all together and they got the perfect marriage and you're thinking to yourself, there's no way he's gonna call them out, but I will. Have you seen this family walking around the church before? <laughs> condescending, this guy thinking he has everything together. I'm gonna tell you all about marriage. I'm just, that's horrible, <laughs> that's, that's terrible. But uh, I know we all get to that place where we see other families and it looks like they fell out of a stock picture frame photo and you're thinking, well, how, do, how did you guys all jump together on time? Like, I don't know how you guys do these things. You see it on social media, you set the expectations, you let your heart go one direction and you're living another. And our hope in this series is that regardless of what family means to you, that we can see what God would wanna lead you into. Regardless of what family looks like for you in this season of life, and what I love about our church is it is so multi-generational. I know there's a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds sitting in this room. And so how we each define family looks different. And more than that, the role that each of us play within our particular family groupings is different. I realize that for some of you in the room, family is something you're looking forward to. You're thinking to yourself, what could that be? Whether it's, I'm gonna get married one day or one day we're gonna have kids. And, and right now, let me just tell you, you will never know more about marriage and parenting than before you're married or have kids. You will never know more. So enjoy it and celebrate it. But maybe you, this is the planning phase. For some of you, you have young kids and you're trying to raise them and you're in that more nuclear family phase where you're trying to make it happen. And there's a lot going on to that. And, and today, we're gonna speak to some of that as well. For some of you, it looks a little less traditional. For some of you, uh, your family isn't just mom and dad and 2.5 kids and a dog and a white picket fence. It's just not the life that you're living. You're thinking, my life is complicated. My family dynamic is not typical. Well, I still believe God is gonna speak to you through this series. And finally, there's, there's a group of people that I know maybe oftentimes we can overlook, but it's a group of people that are maybe in the room today and family's a really hard topic for you. Family is the thing that you've been trying to pull away from rather than lean into. Family is the topic you don't wanna learn more about, you don't wanna make it better because you know some people that were trusted to raise you didn't do a great job. And the people that you put a lot of faith in and hope in, they kinda let you down time after time. And so you're thinking to yourself, how am I gonna navigate this idea of family? Regardless of what role or season that you're in, I believe God wants to speak to us about how to navigate our families well. Because at the end of our life, isn't this one of the most precious things we're ever entrusted with is how we steward the relationship with our family. And so uh, today we're gonna be talking through how to navigate that and where we go to. And I wanna start with a passage in the Bible. And the Bible actually records this famous guy named Joshua, his final sentiments and statements. Now Joshua comes before Jesus, he's in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, and there's a book of the Bible actually named after him. And we get towards the end of his life and he's done some incredible things. He's led the nation of Israel into their promised land that God had set before them. He'd won many battles and he was a great leader, he was a great thinker, he was a great follower of God, and he gets to the end of his life and he brings all these 12 tribes of Israel together to give them this one last sentiment. And just one passage of it, I really wanna highlight. Here's what it says. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you'll serve, because you're gonna serve somebody. Whether the gods of your ancestors, they, they serve beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in the land that you're living in today. So you could serve what everyone else around you serves. But, and this is so famous, this next part you may have seen on a sign at TJ Maxx or Hobby Lobby. This next part you maybe have seen cross-stitched next to like a dove and a cross at grandma's house. This is so good, I love this one. But, as for me in my household, we will serve the Lord. And you're like, wow, that is so perfectly church. That's great. As for me in my household, we will serve the Lord. He really sets this edge to say, if I have no other legacy, I hope it's that the people that are in my household 
would recognize that I serve the Lord and they aspire to as well. And it got me thinking. The last part makes a lot of sense, especially in the context of the Bible or in the context of church, but maybe before that, I wonder what you'd think about this. As for me and my household, how do you finish that? If you're honest, we probably have a lot of superficial things. Like as for me and my household, we drink Coke and not Pepsi, right? Isn't that like the way God intended it? I'll give you another example for me. As for me and my household, we set the temperature of our home to 65 degrees, the way that God intended it. And some of you, in here, I go to your homes and it's like 72, okay? And I know Microsoft stock is ripping, but that's just, that's negligence. That's like, that's, it's too much. It's opulence. You can't, that's too much. You have that sweet spot range of 64 to like 66, maybe 67 if you're really getting crazy with it. Anyone else agree? You agree with that? Okay. As for me, my household, last one. For me and my household, we watch movies and TV shows with the subtitles on. Doesn't matter. Do we, we anyone else subtitle people? Yes. Oh, God's people. I love that. I thought I heard one person start to clap and then realize, oh, maybe, not a clap moment. Not no, we're just, we're just into it. I, I love watching TV shows and they're like, oh, you watch a lot of like international films? Like, no, English. It doesn't matter. I will watch whatever, and we will read it at the same time. It is awesome. I don't know why. We've just gotten used to it. What does it look like for you? Like, as for you and your household, you're like a ski family, not a snowboard family, and everyone knows it. As for you and your household, you vote for, say it out loud. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but as for all of us, we have things that we're known for and we're recognized for. As for you and your household, you're the neighbor with the perfect lawn. Oh, man, we all hate that neighbor, but they have the perfect lawn. That's what we do in my household. And the superficial ones that we can probably recognize or are kind of fun to talk about. But if you dig just a little bit deeper, there's probably some that you're less proud of that are true as well. As for me and my household, maybe, maybe you'd finish that and say, we never apologize. As for me and my household, we succeed at any cost. As for me and my household, we avoid conflict instead of managing it. As for me, in my household, well, fill in the blank. What does it look like for you? And if you had to take an honest answer of figuring out what does your household stand for? Joshua made it very clear. You're gonna, you're gonna be about something, so why not make it about what God might have for you? I used to tell this, uh, well, I thought it was a really great illustration. It was like one of my favorites. I would talk about this small town called Wallace, Idaho, and I used to, oh, I, this was such a good story, you guys. I used to tell this story about Wallace, and Wallace was an old mining town where they found a silver mine nearby, and so it exploded, but when the mine dried up, so did the town. And so it was a small, quaint little town in the mountains of northern Idaho. There's not really much going on there. And, uh, it, and that really changed in 1996 when they filmed the blockbuster hit movie, Dante's Peak, right in Wallace, Idaho. My family heard about it. They heard that the one, the only, dreamy-eyed, smoldering Pierce Brosnan was gonna be there, Mr. 007 himself. And so my family, we actually drove out to Wallace, and it was a zoo. No one knew where to park. No one knew. It, we, we totally overwhelmed the systems of the city. It was amazing. And today, still, if you go to Wallace, every shop you walk into is like, Pierce Brosnan walked here, and uh, Dante's Peak was filmed here, and here's a shot from the movie, and it's all of these scenes all about this, this moment when Dante's Peak came to town, and uh, I would always talk about this, and I would tell the illustration, and I would say, you know, uh, the same thing is true for us, that we can be known for something. When someone pulls into your life, what are you known for? Does Jesus even show up in the equation? And it was a good illustration. And uh, one time I'm speaking at, at a church and I, uh, I start getting into it. And I bring up Wallace, Idaho, and I'll never forget. Someone off to my right up here in the front is an older gentleman, looks startled, physically startled. He leans back, he's surprised. He leans in when I bring Wallace. It's strange, but I just let it go. I finish my illustration. Everybody comes to love the Lord. It was like, it was just home run. It was awesome. After the service, this guy just... V lines it for me. And he's like, I did not know what you were gonna talk about when you brought up Wallace, Idaho, like concerned. Wow, okay, yeah, no. He said, I grew up near there, and when I was growing up, Wallace, Idaho was known because it had the largest brothel in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> he goes, it was the hub of prostitution. 
It was Las Vegas before Las Vegas. It was Wallace, Idaho. Like everybody knows Wallace is purely about prostitution. And I said, that is not true. It is the home of Pierce Brosnan. Like that is, you are mistaken. And in and, and just one moment, it evaporated this incredible illustration I had about being known for something. But it gave me a great illustration about rebrands. And uh, isn't it amazing to see that just one generation apart, Wallace, Idaho is known for something totally different that I had no idea of its history or its past that to me, it only holds one fun memory. And I'm curious, when I bring up family, I get a lot of things might come up for you. Some things you're not proud of, some things you're excited about, some highlight moments and some really pitfall moments. But isn't it interesting that we're just one generation away from a total rebrand? Isn't it interesting that for your family, you're one generation away from being that family that had nothing to do with faith to the family that served the Lord? And it really hangs in the balance of what you decide to do. And I believe through the work of Jesus and then also through some work of our own, if those come together, that he is capable of restoring and redeeming any family story, really any personal story, and bringing it to a place that serves the Lord. So for the rest of our weeks, we're gonna talk about a bunch of different practical things. We're gonna talk about parenting. We're gonna talk about marriage. It's gonna be great. But for this week, I wanna fly at 30,000 feet. And I wanna talk just simply on the idea of how do we start a family rebrand? How do we start a family rebrand? If we're gonna kind of strip it down to the studs and start to change the narrative or story, for some of you, this is just gonna be changing by a degree or two. For some of you, this is gonna be a 180 turn. But either way, I believe that we can start to change the way that we navigate our families. You guys ready? There's that one hour sneaking up on you right there. An hour from now, you're gonna be so excited. Here we go. Don't let your family live on leftovers. First one, don't let your family live on leftovers. Leftovers have their place. I, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna be transparent. I'm a sinner, I get it, it's not good stewardship. I don't like leftovers, it's not me. Any leftover people in here, you love like the taste of microwave. You like things just a little drier than they're supposed to be. Like those kind of people, that's great, that's awesome. And God's using you in that way. We all need one of you in the family. That's, who just doesn't have taste buds or discretion. That's awesome. But for me, and I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You're thinking to yourself, Lance is so wasteful. I know. Like Lance is just not good stewardship. I know. But I'm okay with it. I just, it's just where I've come to. And you're thinking, your poor wife. I mean, that is your role in the family. You're supposed to eat the leftovers. And I get it. Guys, if I have one sin in my life, there's one, okay, we can handle that one. It's gonna be all right. But for all of us, we may like different things with leftovers or not like them. We can all agree on one thing, though. There's one stand above leftover that I will consume and love. What's the best leftover ever? Pizza. Yeah, people of God. I love it. Pizza somehow gets better. I don't know how it works, but it does. And here's the thing when it comes to leftovers. No one can fight you that leftovers are convenient. That's why you do it. You don't have to cook anything. You don't have to prepare anything. It's already have. You're using what you got. I understand convenience. But if you're honest, your family isn't looking for a relationship of convenience from you. They don't want the convenient version of you. And your family, I get it, we're all busy. Your family can live off leftovers sometimes. Sometimes you're gonna come home, it's gonna be an exhausting day, you're gonna be sick, it's cold and flu season. I understand your family's just gonna have to operate on some leftovers. But at what point are we hitting the tipping point where now it's just becoming kind of the normal diet is leftovers? Or are they getting the best version of you? And this applies for any role within the family. Think about it. Obviously, we think about it most naturally as parents, Parents, are you giving your kids the best? Or are you giving them just kind of what you have left over? For husbands and wives, are you giving your, your spouse the best of you? Or just really what you have left? Think about the kids, kids in the room who have parents. It could be adult, adult kids, it could be younger kids, whatever. Are we giving your family the best that you have of you? Or are you just giving them the leftovers? Are you giving them a quick head nod at dinner and then up to your room? Or are you giving them really what could be best for you. I figured parents start cheering at that moment, but that's fine. We're just gonna keep moving. Just cross that out of my notes. It's fine. It really is a stewardship issue, and it sounds crazy, but it is. And let me just bring it into one perspective, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna shoot really straight right here for a moment. Can we all, me included, stop being surprised that the people around us have needs? Can we, just, just for a moment, can we stop being surprised that the people around us actually have needs in their life and they want something from us. 
we come home and our kids, you know, they jump on us or they want money or whatever it is. You're like, ah, oh, didn't see this coming. Don't be surprised. I know when I come home at some point in the evening, my wife's gonna wanna debrief the day. We're gonna wanna talk. She's gonna wanna tell me what's going on for her. She's gonna wanna know what's going on for me. It's not a burden. It's a need, and that's okay. That's a responsibility that I have. But we look to the people around us, we just think, oh, what a burden that we have. So I'll give them what I have left over. But doesn't our family deserve better than that? Don't you hope to be known for more than that? Think about it this way in 1 Peter, it says this. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. This is talking to really any parent in the room. It's just anything like that. But don't be surprised at the fiery trials. As if something strange were happening to you. As if this is unheard of or unknown. I can't believe I got in a family unit and they have expectations of me. Oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe that my parents still today call me with the audacity to wonder what's going on in my life. Like, oh, don't you know I'm busy? I'm busy. I have, so, I have kids of my own now. I have plenty of stuff going on. And they're too kind to say it, but it's like, hey, Joker, we spent 18 years of our life raising you. Why don't you pay attention for a moment? Of course we're gonna need something from you because that's how relationships work. So let's not be as surprised anymore and start to figure out, ration, negotiate, where we're gonna invest our time and what things are gonna be worthy of our leftovers. In a succinct way, here's what I want you to realize. Don't confuse what you do first or longest with your day as the primary thing in your day. Think about it. Don't confuse what you wake up and do first, that that's not gonna get all your energy, or the thing you do longest. If you're going to work, I get it, it's a long stretch in the middle of your day. Don't think just because I committed that time first that it's the primary thing of my day. There may be something even more important that God is inviting you to, to steward when it comes to your time. Second thing is this, win in your unique role. Win in your unique role because you have a unique role within any family unit. And here's what I know, that all of us are known for many roles and responsibilities, that we have different titles to different people. I get that. And I get amidst all of these roles and responsibilities that you have, it can feel like you're just exhausted spinning all these plates. And we use that phrase a lot. We use it, we're tired or exhausted or spinning plates. And it actually was an old circus routine. It's actually where it originated with, where guys would start with one plate, start spinning it, move to the next one and spin it and spin it and spin it and spin it. And the tension came in of like, how far can they go? There's no way they can manage this enough to add another plate. There's no way they can keep moving and spinning more plates because this is just getting overwhelming. And then the tension would build and he'd spin them all and you're thinking, not a chance. And he would go and he would add one more plate and the crowd would go wild and we'd start spinning plates. And at some point, it kind of becomes this badge of honor, which is why we are drawn towards walking into the lobby. People saying, how's your week? And you go, oh, exhausted. Tired, you know, just spinning a lot of plates. Doing a lot of stuff, you know, broad shoulders for a reason, you know, a lot, of, a lot of weight to be carried by me with my family and work, and being just really generally successful, you know, it's a lot to manage. And we'd see it and we'd go, wow, you're impressive. You are so impressive. And when it gets to your family, you might think it looks, looks less like this and more like this one. That might be your family. You're thinking to yourself, my kids look pretty while well, I got a foot in my face, I'm in a lot of pain holding it all together, I'm the base of this whole thing, everyone else is spinning their plates, I'm spinning mine, and you're thinking to yourself, how are we gonna have time for anything? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna navigate this? How are we gonna make this through? And it got me thinking, like for my family, when it comes to plates, practically, we have two versions of plates in my house. We have, uh, we have plastic plates, because we have little kids, little kids who are three and five, and so a lot of times they get stuck with these ones. They get stuck with the plastic plates because I can load them up with food, and really, ultimate, it's pretty much a Frisbee turned upside down is what it looks like. Very resilient. They can drop it, they can do kid hand gestures, and worst case scenario, you clean up a little bit of the mess of the food that was on there, but they're so daggum resilient, it's amazing. And then we have these. And affectionately, at my home, these are called grown-up plates, uh, when it comes to my kids, and they're getting just old enough where they're really curious about grown-up plates, and they love them. But what we always tell our kids is, yeah, you can do whatever you want with these, but with these, I want focus, I want hand grip, I want two hands, not one hand, two hands on the plate, I want you to walk slowly, no running, I want eye contact with the plate and ahead of you, just up and down, head on a swivel. That's what I want. I want foot in front of the other. Why? Because you gotta steward this more. This is like resilient. This is very breakable. This is, there's a lot going on with this plate. And here's what I think we lose track of 
because we start spinning so many plates and we get all this success and we get all these different things, we start losing track over which one's plastic and which one's breakable. We just start losing track of what's plastic and what's ceramic. We start to lose track that there's different consequences. And so because we start spinning so many plates, we start moving and we start moving and we start moving and one falls and it's not that big of a deal. Like, yeah, there's consequences and there's outcome and it's disappointing and whatever, but it's, it's really not that drastic. You don't get too worried about it. But then it starts to blur. You start to move and you start to, to get your life going. And all of a sudden, whether you meant to or not, you lost track on which ones are valuable. And unfortunately, one of the <laughs> valuable plates dropped. And this happens to each and every one of us. We look at it, it falls, and it didn't break. And he got away with something. And you thought to yourself, yeah, my kid was disappointed I didn't make it to their game, but they got over it. Yeah, my spouse and I, we fought for a bit, we went to therapy, and we're fine now. And what we trick ourselves into doing is we start to think that these plates are unbreakable. Be honest. You start to think to yourself, yeah, 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 okay, I can actually get away with more than I think I can. And so you move, and you work, and you try it all out, and you go again and again and again, and it wasn't until the second time that it fell, that it broke. And you thought to yourself, it wasn't supposed to break because the first time it didn't break. Why are you more mad this time? Because it's the same thing that I did. You know I have to prioritize work, so why are you still so upset? Hey, I talked to you this way before, and I get it. I'll just say sorry like I did last time. Hey, I know I couldn't make it this time, but you know it's a busy season for me. And unfortunately, we've just lost track of which plate's really important. We've lost track of which plate is really breakable. And now there's a lot of work to be done. And what I just would want to spare you, and unfortunately, I realize that for some of you, you're on the other side of a fallen plate. And you're trying to figure it out. And I think, you know what, including God in the mix is an incredible place to start. But can this just serve as a warning for some of us that are spinning a lot of plates to just simply take inventory and wonder, what are the things that I can do that are the most important? It says this in 1 Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially the members of his household, he's denied his faith. Ugh, strong words. And he's worse than an unbeliever? That for some reason, there's just like the faith component to the fact that we are called to steward our family relationships well. Does it look different for everybody? Yes, Sometimes do other people not reciprocate? Yes. But what can you do? What can you do to help spin these plates? I was asked a question years ago. And uh, it was in a message. And uh, I don't know about you. I'm just gonna be honest. When uh, people on a stage like this tell me things to do, to, like go home and here's an exercise I want you to do, I just don't do it. I'm, just, I'm gonna level with you. I don't do it. But for some reason, I did. And this one, he said, go home, find some space, and answer this question for yourself. What are the things that only you can do? What are the things that only you can do? I thought, fine, 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 I'll play along. And I went home, and I didn't like light candles and play worship music, but I just like did it. And I started writing down the things that only I can do. And the real challenge was to show it to somebody that you trust, somebody that you love. So I showed it to a friend that I trusted. And I said, hey, you know, I had this exercise to write down what are the things that only you can do. And uh, this friend was thankfully really honest. See, Lance, there's a lot of things on here that I can see why you'd want to put on there, but I think these are things that other people can do. You just do better. So you think it's the only, you're the only person who can do it because you just do it better than the average bear. And for you, I bet there's a lot of things in your life that you can do better than most people, but other people can do it. I know I'm the only one who can be dad to my daughter, Winter. I know I'm the only one that can be dad to my daughter, Capri. I know I'm the only one that better be husband to my wife, <laughs> Jacqueline. And if you're honest, I wonder what that looks like for you. What are the things that only you can do? This might be long, it might fill it in, it might take some time. Some of the things might be noble and important. But for each of us, what are the things that only you can do? And how are you gonna steward your family well around them? Next point. You have to set a clear example. You have to set a clear example. For each of our families, um, we like to teach a lot using words because it's how we usually communicate. 
But isn't it interesting a lot more of what happens in your family is caught rather than taught? Like a lot of it is, is seen by your example. It's not necessarily things that you communicate as clearly. In fact, Barna, the research group, did a study not too long ago of Christians that they know 80% more, they believe 80, 80% more things about Jesus than they actually do. So like for all of us Christians, I'm included in this, we know a lot, but we may not implement a lot. And we start to trick ourselves into thinking based on what I know or what I communicate, it's equivalent to things that I do. But unfortunately, that's not true. And I want you to think about it in the context of your family. Think about it through the question that's hardest to nail down. But what are the things that you usually celebrate as a family? I'm not talking birthdays. <laughs> but I'm talking about what things you usually celebrate. You usually celebrate good behavior, noble things. You celebrate being kind. You celebrate uh, doing your chores and doing your homework and good and good grades. Those are all great. But... What things do you celebrate that are of God? Because the same thing is true for business as it is for family. Like you know when it comes to a business, the things that you celebrate often get repeated and become culture. What? What gets rewarded gets repeated and ultimately becomes our culture. So that happens in your workplace. You know that to be true. But the same thing happens in your family. What you celebrate oftentimes trickles down and becomes the culture of your family and starts to answer that first question you ask for me and my family, we're gonna be known for what? Being great athletes? Being on select sports? I don't, I don't know, you fill in the blank. But what we celebrate oftentimes gets repeated. So if we wanna celebrate the things that God would be about, I know that can seem abstract, but there's actually a really clear list in the Bible. And in Galatians 5, it gives us this list of things that followers of Jesus should be known for empirically, that we should be able to see in other people. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance, also called patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What if we as a family started to celebrate those things? The moments when we saw love, the moments where we saw kindness that wasn't expected, a gentleness in tone. Hey, I, I saw that things were starting to escalate and I could see everyone was getting frustrated, but you kept your composure you kept hold of your emotions and you came with gentleness and it really de-escalated the situation. Thank you for doing that. That meant the world. I think that changed the course of our family, that you were in control in those moments. What would it look like to celebrate some of the things that God would have us celebrate? I put it in your notes this way, if you're taking notes. The best families are built through imitation, not information. The best families are built, they're constructed, it takes effort, through imitation, not just information. Not just the information that we can bring to each other. It says this in Philippians 4, 9. Whatever you've learned from me or received or heard from me or you've seen in me put into practice, think about it this way. We are very good with the learned, received, and heard. We're great with that. We, we actually do that a lot. And we expect that that is what gets put into practice. But the Apostle Paul was smart enough to know that what you've seen in me is probably gonna weigh more. Those things start to put into practice. My dad, um, when I was young, he, uh, he would, we'd see him get stressed sometimes and then be calm and stressed and calm and stressed and calm. And one day we asked him about it. And he said, you know, I just keep checking my investment portfolio in the stock market. And my mom, it's funny, she could peg how the market was doing, how my dad was responding. And uh, so he knew early on, which is great, props to him for having the awareness of this. He knew early on, he told us this, he says, you know what, at some point I just don't check anymore because I'm not gonna engage with it right now, so why ride the highs and lows? Because people spend a lifetime, maybe some of the people in the room, trying to time the market, trying to get in at the right time and get out at the right time and project what's gonna happen, and it's an exhausting endeavor. And it can be really oftentimes fruitless to time the market so well of when you're gonna put in your investment. So what do analysts tell you to do? They tell you to invest over time. That you should invest over time and just look for consistency rather than maybe strategically trying to invest. I think the same thing is true with how we invest in our families. That we would like to highlight certain moments of our life for our kids to listen. So like, hey kids, in a week we're gonna be in Hawaii for spring break, we're gonna be on the beach, I need you to listen to everything. Just watch how I navigate life, okay? Watch how, I, how I'm calm and collected. But you know that stressful work week? Just everybody don't listen. Don't watch me at all. This is not a time to glean anything from your father or your mother. This is not what I need for this moment. So we think we can time when our input happens, but that's not the case. In fact, you know this to be true. The other day, my dad asked me if I remembered a particular lesson that he taught me. He said, I remember when I taught you this? I'm like, no, I don't. I don't remember that. And he said, what? What are you talking about? It breaks my heart. I said, I do remember this other time. And he's like, that is what you remember? 
of all the things, of all the powerful moments when the lighting was just right, and that's what you remember, the monologues that I had written, the lessons that I had taught, I even made them rhyme, and that's what you remember? Because it wasn't strategic. It was just lived. It was invested over time. Success is something that each and every one of us want in this room. But what if you started to think about it this way? Success is measured by what you do, but legacy is measured by what others do in imitation of you. Think about it. Success is measured by what you do, and so many of you are so successful. Way to go. But legacy, well, that's what other people do when they imitate you. And that's, I think, a real barometer of success. That's fruitfulness. That's what we want for our families, which leads me to my last point. This is where I'm gonna close. Is you have to focus on an eternal legacy. You have to focus on an eternal legacy. Let's tell you one story, and then we're gonna sing a song together. Uh, years ago, I went to a funeral for a coworker, and he had lived an incredible life. I didn't know him that well. Um, we'd known each other kind of peripherally as we worked together, but I didn't know a lot about him. And what's so beautiful about a memorial service is that you get to learn so much about somebody. And uh, during this memorial service, I learned that he was an avid golfer. I'm like, what a man of God, that's incredible. And more than that, he went on incredible opulent golf trips, like incredible ones. He had friends come up and tell stories and show pictures of them in Scotland and playing golf all over the world. I'm like, that is what I wanna do, that's incredible. He, uh, he had somebody come up and tell a story that he worked at Microsoft, and I, I knew that about him, but he worked for 20 years at Microsoft. I didn't know much about what he did, but I found out that the reason he started working at Microsoft is because Bill Gates personally invited him to join the initial marketing team of Microsoft. Pretty impressive. That's phenomenal. I learned that he was a foodie and loved incredible food. So when he traveled the world with his family, they went to the best restaurants, he cooked all the best things, and I'm like, I love eating, I love golf, this guy's incredible. And it wasn't until a moment later that his kids got up and they started talking about how much respect they had for their dad. They started talking about how much they admired him and loved him and the way that he followed Jesus would forever set an example for them. And then his wife got up. She brought clarity that I didn't know is that he actually didn't grow up in church. He may have a story that a lot of you resonate with. He wasn't a, a church person or even a God person and then kind of became a general God person. Then he started coming to church and became kind of a church person and ultimately became a Jesus follower. And once he became a Jesus follower, his life changed. And some of these stories of legacy and the way that her sons viewed him, it's because of the way he followed Jesus. She got to talk about how much she loved, admired, and respected her husband for the life that he, he led, for the way that he loved her the way he took care of his family, for the way he prioritized them. And I thought to myself, golf trips are great. Food is awesome. But that's the legacy I wanna leave. That's the stories I want told about me at the end of my life. Is I want the ones closest to me that know me the best. Say, man, that, that guy didn't get it perfect. It's far from it. But as for him, in his household, he tried to serve the Lord. It wasn't always easy, it was always convenient. But I do wonder for you, what could it mean? What could it mean today to start to rebrand your family in a way that you've always wanted it to be? So as we close, uh, would you do me a favor? Would you stand to your feet? You can set everything down. I'm gonna pray for you. Um, I'd invite you just in a public place like this to get a, just a moment of privacy. Would you consider bowing your head and closing your eyes? I'm gonna pray, Heavenly Father, thank you Thank you for every person in this room who's taken a little bit of time from their hectic week of spinning a lot of plates, being a lot of things to a lot of different people. And they've come, and just for a moment, whether they expect it or not, they've been forced with the opportunity to reexamine and renegotiate what's priority. God, we know you've called us in a unique way to steward the relationships that mean the most to us really well. And when we do that, I think it's an honest reflection of how much you love us. That is, as you love us, so we are called to love other people. I pray today for uncomfortable amounts of clarity around what plates we can let fall and what plates we really need to guard, what things we need to protect and steward. In a way that only you can do, God, would you bring a sense of clarity? Would you bring a sense of focus? God, to people in the room who are thinking it's too far gone, 
is too far done, would you remind them that you are able to restore and redeem anything? That nothing is too far gone for your love, your grace, your compassion, and your mercy. Heavenly Father, no story is finished yet, and there's still time. There's still time to change the narrative and be known for something. More than just something general, but being known as someone who follows you. So Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone in the room for wisdom, for courage. I pray for blessing over their life as they navigate their families. And Heavenly Father, we pray all of this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's sing this out together. Otherwise, this is the end of our service. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.
at Timberlake. If I just stand with us as we sing, we're gonna sing about the greatness of our God. Worship our King, come and let us bow at His feet, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Promise 
Say 
pray. God, we acknowledge that you are holy, that you are great, that you are powerful. Not only are you powerful, but you are present with us. And it's humbling to think that the creator of the universe knows our name and knows our story and wants to be in relationship with us. And that reality changes everything it, and it impacts how we live and how we view ourselves. And so God, I just pray that we would experience your presence today, that all of us, no matter what our history is, no matter where we've been, no matter what's going on in our lives today, that we would experience your presence today. Thank you that you want to be in relationship with us. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Timberlake and welcome on Bad Daylight Savings Sunday. You are at church and to reward you for that, we have donuts in the lobby. So you are welcome. They are calorie free, sugar free, guilt free donuts today. today. And uh, for those of you who chose to stay in your pajamas and join us online, we are glad that you are with us uh, today as well. When you came in, you received the program. There's a connect card in there. There's also a QR code on the front of the seat and back in front of you. Uh, we would just love to know that you're here. If this is one of your first few times at Timberlake, we would love to help you get connected and uh, get you plugged in here uh, at the church. Uh, Easter is coming up in just a few short weeks. Easter is an incredible experience uh, here at Timberlake. I hope if you're in town, you're planning to join us uh, for that. I hope you had an opportunity, um, and, or we'll take the opportunity in the next few weeks to uh, invite a friend as well. And then we have serve on Easter inserts uh, that you can grab. You can turn them in at the Connect Center or drop it off in the black boxes on your way out uh, as well. We have three days worth of services, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Just make sure to note that our Sunday time are different than our normal weekend times. Uh, but it's gonna be an incredible experience. I hope you'll be able to join us uh, for that. We're also gonna receive an offering if you would like to invest financially in the mission and ministry here at Timberlake. Uh, your generosity makes a huge difference. You can set that up through our app or through our website or use the black uh, drop boxes on your way out uh, as well. Usually you get to see uh, one of the ways that your generosity is making a difference in our local or global outreach partners. This weekend, uh, you get to see how it's making a difference in our next generation uh, through our student ministries. And so we have a great video uh, for you to see in just a moment. Before we get into that, though, do me a favor, find somebody near you, introduce yourself, say hello, and then you can have a seat. what God's doing in the next generation of our church. It's phenomenal to see. And I already know what you're thinking. That looks way more fun than this. this that is way more exciting. And you are not wrong. That is way more fun than this. Uh, my name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm kicking off a new series of talks. And uh, we're going to be talking about family. In fact, our picture perfect families. Isn't that what we all kind of aspire for? Is that at least on the outside we're seen as having it together, and uh, I'm going to be honest, right away from the beginning, this is a really fun talk for me to do at a different church. Like, this is really fun for me uh, to get on a plane and fly to a different church and show a picture of my family and be like, they're just so perfect. Look, their hair's all done, and they're so great, and everyone goes, wow, your family looks all put together. I'm like, they really are, and I'm a great dad. She's a great mom, and they're just perfect kids, 
because they never meet him. And it's like awesome. They never get a chance to meet him. But here, my family walks these hallways. My family walks this lobby. In fact, uh, my guess is some of your kids go to school with my kids. And so you see when I drop them off, and my girls have like blown out ponytails and toothpaste all over and nothing's put together and I forgot their homework and that visual aid for that thing. And you see those moments, and so you're thinking, man, that is not a picture-perfect family. And I'm gonna tell you, it's intimidating in a church like this, full of good-looking people like you who are all driven and successful and tenacious Eastsiders, and you walk around, and your family does look picture-perfect. You walk in, and I'm, I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking, you guys have never fought before, ever. The only time you raise your voice is in worship. Like, that's it. Like, <laughs> when the music's playing, that's the only time. It's just in singing praise to God, and that's not true for my family. So I'm like, ah, that's uncomfortable. In fact, I don't wanna make it personal, but I'm going to. There is one family in here that just is so, I'm gonna say the word condescending. They look down on everybody and they just feel like snobs. They have it all together. It's the perfect kids and the perfect marriage and all the perfect things. And you're thinking, wow, I'm gonna try and fill in the blanks and guess who it is. I'm gonna tell you who it is. I'm gonna show you a picture. Have you seen this family walking around the church before? It's obnoxious. This guy feels like he's got everything together in every moment. He's got always the perfect thing. That's horrible. I'm sorry. But Dave, Pastor Dave, is actually speaking in our high school ministry right now, which is phenomenal. How great is it that we have a pastor when he has a weekend off, he chooses to invest in the next generation? I don't know about you, but I love that. So if you're a high schooler, I won't even be offended. There's a better message happening across the hallway. You stand up, you walk out, no qualms for me. Grab a donut on the way. It's a win-win. I mean, really, it's a benefit for you. But as we do talk about families, here's what I know. Family looks different for everybody. That we all have our idea of what family could be. And honestly, whether you like it or not, you're a part of a family. You, have, you play a role of some sort in a family. And for all of us, it looks different. And it's different based on our background, how we grew up, and what our ideas of family are. But we also know this is a beautifully, wonderfully multi-generational church. So our roles look different based on the season of life that we're in. For some of you, you're in the planning and preparing stage, that you're looking ahead to maybe what marriage could look like or having kids could look like. And uh, you're learning from these kind of environments where you're thinking, okay, what could this be as I look ahead? And here's what I'll just tell you. I'll warn you right away. You will never know more about marriage or parenting than before you get married and have kids. So enjoy it while you have it and just live in it and maybe take notes. And this is gonna be great to set you up to win. For some of you, you're raising kids, you're in the middle of it just like me and you kind of have your nuclear family and that's the focus when you hear family. There's obviously some peripheral, but that's where predominantly your attention goes. For some of you, you don't have what would look like a traditional family. So you'd say to me, man, that's not what we look like. We don't have mom, dad, 2.5 kids and a dog and a white picket fence. That's just not how things have panned out for my life. So for each of us, family could look really different. And I also know something else to be true. That for some of you in the room, the idea of family brings up a lot of pain, a lot of frustration, maybe even resentment and regret that you've spent a lot of time trying to withdraw from your family because, to be honest, it was toxic. It wasn't healthy. That the people who were entrusted to raise you and steward that responsibility well botched it. They did not do a great job. And so for you, the idea of family brings a lot of baggage and a lot of frustration, a lot of remorse. And for, you're already thinking, I don't want to be a part of this. But here's what I believe. Regardless of what season or role or responsibility you have when it comes to a family, that for each of us, God has called us to steward it well. And he speaks clearly to maybe some great practices and principles that we can implement in how we navigate our family. Because at the end of the day, it is one of the most important things that we have. It's one of the most pivotal relationship groups that we have. So how we navigate it means so much. And through this series, we're gonna be talking over the next few weeks of how to do it from different lenses and different perspectives. Today, I'm gonna fly at 30,000 feet. We're gonna talk a lot about family in general. Uh, next week, I think Pastor Dave's talking about parenting. Then we'll talk about marriage. There'll be a few different things in this. But I would encourage you to start to think through what would God wanna do when it comes to my relationship with my family? And uh, I wanna start with a passage that comes from the first half of our Bible. It's the Old Testament. It comes before Jesus is on the scene. And this incredible leader and hero within our Bibles, we get to hear one of his speeches right before his deathbed. It's actually recorded in the Bible. And uh, what's phenomenal about this speech in the book of Joshua, said by Joshua, 
is that he gets to detail some of the things in retrospect. He gets to call together all of the nation of Israel, all 12 tribes, and he gets to call them together and give them these last final words. And I wanna take just one part of it that pertains to family. You actually might have seen some of this before. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, well then, choose for yourself this day. Whom will you serve? Because at the end of the day, we're all gonna have to serve somebody with our life. Whether uh, the gods of your ancestors uh, served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in the, whose land you are living still today. You could serve all the things that everyone else around you serves. And then this is the verse. <laughs> this is the part of it that you've seen at Hobby Lobby on a sign. You've seen a TJ Maxx. You've seen this part like, cross-stitched at grandma's house with like a dove and a heart and a cross. And it's just beautiful on a pillow somewhere, crocheted. I don't know. What, but you've seen this part. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. And Joshua really just decides to draw a line in the sand and say, at the end of his life, you have a lot of opportunities to serve and chase and succeed in a lot of different ways, and you can do that. But for me, my goal was, and I hope this is really the legacy that I leave, is that we were gonna serve the Lord. Now, the second half, talking about serving the Lord, is pretty predictable, we see that stuff in church. But I wanna just take a step backwards for a second. And ask the question, ask for me and my household, well, what? What fills in for you? There's some fun stuff in there that we could talk about, like for me, personally. As for me and my household, we are Coke people, not Pepsi people, right? So I got intended it. Yeah, one, you work for Coke, that's awesome. Um, we, uh, we here, here, my household, as for my household, we set the temperature in our home to 65 degrees the way God intended it. And some of you in here, listen, I go into your houses, it's 72 or something ridiculous. I get Microsoft stuff is ripping. I get it. That's cool. But that's opulence. That's wasteful. It's just insane. Right in that sweet spot of like 64 to 67, that's where God lives. That's it. As for me and my house, this is, I'm just, just for me. For me and my house, we watch movies and TV shows with the subtitles on. Where are my subtitle people? Yes, yes, you wanna read and hear and watch, you want the full experience, don't you? It's great, and you're thinking, oh, wow, you watch like a lot of international films and stuff? No, like English, like English. <laughs> English and English, like it's just like, I'm reading subtitles, I love it, and I know those are silly, like you might have some as well, like uh, for your family, you might, as for me and my household, we are skiers, not snowboarders, whatever it may be. As for me and my household, we vote, everyone out loud, say it. I'm just kidding, could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine? Like one person does, just yells it. That's awesome. Um, we all have some that we know, and honestly, you probably have a reputation for. Like people around you know what you and your household stand for. They know the things that you're about. They know the things that uh, you guys prioritize. And if you, you don't have to dig very deep to start to figure out what those are. But what if you did? What if you dig a little bit deeper and you start to see Maybe what's underneath the surface that you're less proud of but has kind of become a culture of your home. For example, maybe if you're honest, you'd say, as for me and my household, we choose to avoid conflict rather than manage it. As for me and my household, we choose to win fights at any expense. That we don't stop until somebody's crying and the louder you get, the more important you are. As, as for me and my household, we've, we've decided to prioritize success over everything. And that we'll only be proud if you're successful. I don't, I don't know what it looks like for you, but I imagine there's some things that have crept into the culture of your home that if you're honest, it's not always as cliche as a pillow. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. That if you're honest, that sometimes things can get challenging and messy and complicated. And so for this series, I know it seems a bit aspirational, but what would it look like to start to reorient our life and our faith to maybe make this statement more true? It won't always be perfect, but if we can make it more honest. There's an illustration I used to tell all the time. It was one of my favorites, and then it got ruined, but I will tell it to you anyway. It was this beautiful illustration 
about Wallace, Idaho, this small mountain town. Look how quaint this looks, a little bushel of flowers. It's beautiful. It's this little mountain town called Wallace, Idaho, and it really got founded in the heyday of silver mining in Idaho, and as the, as the mine grew, so did the city, and uh, eventually the mine started to shrink, and so did the city, and so the city is kind of a shell of what it once was, and not really known for much anymore. And that changed in 1996 when the number one blockbuster movie, Dante's Peak, was filmed in Wallace, Idaho, with the one and only Mr. Dreamy himself, 007. Look at that smolder. Pierce Brosnan was in this movie about Dante's Peak, about this volcano that was next to a city that had to evacuate. And I grew up not too far away, and so I remember my family heard about it, and for some reason, my mom really wanted to lead the charge to see Pierce Brosnan. I'll leave that up to her, but uh, so we took a family trip over there, and it was packed on the days of filming. It was a zoo. The poor town didn't know what to do with it, Um, but they filmed this movie there, and still today, if you go to Wallace, every store you walk into has Dante's Peak merch which is great, and like Pierce Brosnan walked here, like it's a Holy Land site. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see. Everyone hypes Dante's Peak in small walls. I don't know what it's known for. And so I used to end that story with this little illustration of like, hey, if you're honest, if people just take a drive-by of your life, what are you known for? And ideally, it would be known in some way for following Jesus. Great illustration, so awesome. I was speaking at a different church one time, and I was saying this illustration, and uh, I started to introduce the idea of Wallace, Idaho. And I remember so vividly a gentleman off to my right, kind of up towards the front, physically responded when I brought up Wallace, Idaho. Leaned in, looked like surprise on his face, exclamatory, he didn't know what was going on. I finished the story, it crushed. Everybody fell in love with Jesus. It was awesome, it was the best. But after the service ended, this guy V-lines it up for me, comes right up to me, gets in my face so enthusiastic. And he's like, I had no idea where you were going with Wallace, Idaho, because I grew up right by there and it was not known for Dante's Peak. It was actually known for having the largest brothel in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> that, that Wallace was the hub of prostitution for the entire region. I mean, this was the place, it was Vegas before Vegas right? It's what happens in Wallace stays in Wallace. Like that's, I didn't know any of this. So I'm shocked. And he's giving me way too many details about Wallace, Idaho. And in that moment, I was heartbroken because I lost this beautiful illustration on being known for something. But what I gained is an incredible illustration on rebranding. Because all of us, come on. I, we are, I didn't know it as a brothel, I knew it for Dante's Peak. And what it reminded me of is we are one generation away from totally rebranding your family. You are one generation away that you might be known for something either as a family or personally and you are one generation removed from rebranding the identity of your family and having the association of your family not be something from the past but maybe something that God would wanna put in it. Maybe something that you would want to put in it. So I believe, I believe this, and I'm not even enough to believe it, that through the work of Jesus Christ, coupled with some work we're gonna put on on our own, that we can rebrand maybe the things that felt hopeless, maybe the things that felt helpless, maybe restore and rehabilitate some relationships that desperately need it. So today, I just have four points on how do we start to rebrand your family a little bit. And this works for me too, just as well as it works for you. Here's what, it, first one, don't let your family live on leftovers. Don't let your family live on leftovers. Now, some of you love eating leftovers. Where are my leftover people at? Yeah, you love the taste of microwave, and you love when food is just a little drier than it was. You know what I mean? Just, you like it just kind of dried out and great. We all have come to accept that there is one food that is top of the food pyramid when it comes to leftovers, and that's pizza. Pizza somehow manages to get better than it originally was, and pizza was pretty great, fresh, but it gets better somehow, and honestly, this is embarrassing to say, but I'm gonna be honest, it's church. I, I don't mess around with leftovers, and I know. You're thinking that's so wasteful, it's disgusting. I know that, and I know like it's just bad stewardship. I totally know that. It's just there's something in me. I don't love it, and it's just not my favorite thing, but the reason I end up eating them and the reason that we all end up utilizing them is convenience, 
Leftovers are so convenient. You're using what you already have. I'm not gonna dirty a bunch of other stuff. I can use it, I can move forward, and I can enjoy it. But here's the thing. We don't operate our relationships out of convenience. Your family doesn't want you in convenience. They don't want the convenient version of you that it was just easier and more accessible for you to engage with them in the way that you chose to engage with them. Instead, they want the primary version of you. They want the best. Think about it in any role. Obviously, the most natural one that we think of is parents to kids. Your parents, your kids want to be the primary role, not just the leftovers of your life. Think about it as a spouse. Your spouse wants you at your best. They, they don't want the leftovers of your life. I mean, I mean, think about this in, in any way. Grandparents, nobody wants the leftovers. It's the time, the convenient when you have it. They want you to engage with the best of you. And, and here's what I just gotta be honest for a second, and maybe we can all just agree with this. I need this reminder, and my guess is many of you do too. Can we all just agree to stop being surprised when the people in our life have needs? Can we do that? Like, I mean, we just get surprised when somebody comes to us and has a need or an expectation. Like a family member comes to you and has an expectation of your relationship, and you're like, oh, what a burden, unbelievable. When I come home after a long day, my kids run and jump on me. They do it, they tackle me, they want it. And I know it's like a cute moment for like four seconds, and then the low back starts to hurt, and I'm like, okay, like, get, 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 you know, get, get off, just get, give, me, give me space. But I gotta remember, my kids have needs. And I, can we not be surprised when your spouse comes home and they wanna hear about your day? And it's not inconvenient. Kids, 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 if you're in here and either, and you have some sort of parent in your life, whether you're a teenager or you are past that and you're an adult with, with adult parents, can we stop being surprised when they want to know how your life is going? Can we stop being, like my parents will still call me today and they'll be like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, well, I'm good. I'm just like, I'm pretty busy. I got a lot going on. It's whatever, whatever. Well, tell us a little bit more. I don't know. I don't have time. I don't have time. Like, man, they're too kind to say. We spent 18 years investing in you. You give me 18 minutes, Okay. Can we do that? Can we just stop being surprised that the people around us have expectations? I mean, think about it this way. First Peter 4.12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials, this is talking to parents here, you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Why is this happening? Why are all these things happening in my life? Why is all this going on? Come on, come on, come on, come on. The people around us have needs and expectations. They don't want the leftovers of your life. They don't want a relationship that's operating purely out of convenience. You can live on a diet of leftovers for a while, but when's the last time you made something fresh for your family? When's the last time you engaged in a real level? And I get immediately every skeptic in the room, I would do the same thing. Your mind goes to, man, if you knew my schedule, if you knew what was going on for me, it's really convenient to say, but if you gave me that little Britney Spears instinct microphone and let me tell you about my week this last week, you would know somebody's gotta eat some leftovers, okay? And it's exhausting sometimes, but Here's just one point I want you to think about. You just do what you want with it. Don't confuse what you do first or longest with your day as the primary thing in your day. Don't confuse the fact that you go to work first and maybe you go to work the longest as the primary thing in your day. I believe that there's maybe something God would invite you to to realize that family, well, family can't live off your leftovers. They were never intended to. Which leads me to my second point. When in your unique role, you have to win in your unique role. Now, I mentioned in the beginning, each of us has a different unique role when it comes to a family, a different dynamic for each of our families, and that's true. And my guess is you have plenty of roles, responsibilities, and titles in your life. Plenty of people who look to you with expectations and desires. I get that. In fact, oftentimes we'll use the illustration, uh, we're spitting a lot of plates. Have you guys heard that before? Oh man, I'm just spitting a lot of plates right now. I'm just a little bit tired. It actually comes from originally circus performers would do this as its own trick that they would start with one plate and spin it on a stick and then they'd move to another one and they move to another one and move to another one and they'd have to go back and continue to keep them spinning as they went. And of course, the tension and lies and the fact that you're lying in, you think there's no way he can add another plate. There's no way that person can add another plate and then they do and the crowd goes wild. And it's like, when is one going to fall? So you, you live on the edge of your seat, leaning in, thinking, oh, when is this gonna happen? And my favorite part is, it kind of becomes this prestigious thing. It kind of becomes this thing where you walk into the office or you even walk into the church in the lobby and people are like, how are you doing? And you go, oh, you know, it's pretty busy. A lot of demands on my life. I'm pretty important, you know, um, a lot of things going, just busy between different activities. And, you know, I'm keeping it all afloat because I'm awesome. 
but, um, but you know, I'm, I'm a lot of demand in my life, and I'm spinning a lot of plates, and it's like, well, didn't you just sign up for something else? Yeah, I did. Yeah, because I'm impressive. And so you just keep spinning all these plates, and we almost take it as a badge of honor that I'm so busy, and I'm so exhausted, and I'm so tired. And honestly, you think this is funny? Like, this is probably more what your family looks like. Your family probably looks more something like this, <laughs> where your kids look perfect and happy with their little timber bucks down in kids' ministry, and they got a foot in your face, and you're in a lot of pain. You're just holding this thing together, frustrated, trying to take a deep breath, wondering when is this going to stop, because I'm spinning too many plates, and I'm exhausted. I think about it this way. My family, um, since we have two little girls that are three and five, we have two different types of plates in our house. <laughs> One of them is plastic plates. Uh, these are a godsend. I mean, these things are amazing. It's pretty much a Frisbee turned upside down. And they can, they're indestructible. You can do anything you want with these things. I love them. And we let my kids eat with them. This is the best. Well, they're all marked up like a Wolverine went on this thing. I guess just, they're just tore up. I don't know what they do. There's just teeth marks on these. And, they can drop them and throw them, and honestly, if they drop it, there's some mess to clean up when it comes to the food, but this thing's indestructible. There's nothing that's gonna happen to these, which is why we give them to my kids. I love it. The, these, though, these are our grown-up plates, and uh, we call these grown-up plates because our kids don't get to use them, and uh, now my kids are getting a little bit older, and they're really intrigued by grown-up plates, but we have different rules around grown-up plates. Those ones, you can walk around and be a kid, walk with one hand. Grown-up plates... You put two hands glued on that plate, kids, and you walk head down, like head down looking where you're going and look up to make sure you don't, like just focus. Slow walk, no running, no horse play, no chaos. If you're handling a grown-up plate, you gotta handle it like a grown-up. And my kids know that, so they get focused. I get scared even letting them like clear the table. I know it's a good thing, but I'm like, I just, I'm gonna handle the, the grown-up plate. Like don't, don't worry about it. Why? Because it's fragile. Because at the end of the day, this one, though I clean up a mess of the contents, it doesn't break. This one could break, which is why I'm like, I don't really want you to mess around with these. And as we get going through life, here's what we do. We start to spin so many plates, we get so busy, we forget which ones are plastic and which ones are breakable. We forget which things are priority and which things are peripheral. And so we start to spin every plate and it gets so many that you're just spinning, but you're not really looking and so you start to look and look and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. And one of these drops and you think, ah, that's a huge mistake. But we'll be fine. It's really not that big of a deal until one of these drops. And you look at it and you think to yourself, it worked. That it wasn't that, I thought it was, I thought it was indestructible. But I mean, got a chip. But that's not too bad. So maybe I can spin more plates. So you start to spin more plates and spin more plates because you got away with it. Because something that everyone says is breakable is fine. All it took was a few weeks of marriage counseling. Yeah, 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 I didn't show up to a game. But, you know, I bought them something afterwards and they were happy with it. You know, yeah, 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 I dropped and I know it's supposed to be really important. But honestly, I think we can let them drop every once in a while. And it's not that big of a deal. Until it is. Until you drop it and it breaks and you thought well no 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 that's not how it's supposed to work I'm supposed to be able to drop them and then not break and I manage it somehow because I'm really good at managing consequences that's why you have a great position at your job is because you can put out fires and manage every consequence but then you look at your family and you think to yourself how am I going to put that back together and maybe just maybe you're sitting here and you already know what that looks like because that's what you're living in too many plates that are too important that are being broken and if you're in that place here, let me just encourage you for a moment. I really believe through the work of Jesus that he can bring restoration and reconciliation to relationships. I truly believe that. It might take work, it might take time, I agree. But I think he can do it. My warning for the rest of us is maybe we don't wanna get to that place. Maybe we start to recognize which plates are plastic and which aren't. Maybe we start to realize and take inventory of the fact that I really have to prioritize some of the plates in my life because some of them have larger consequences. And I think the Bible speaks to this when it comes to our family. In fact, really strong words we're about to read here in 1 Timothy 5 eight. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the members of his household, he has denied the faith. Ooh, being a strong man. He is worse than an unbeliever. It's better that you don't even believe in God at that point. Wow. 
It's almost as if the Bible's trying to communicate. There's an inexplicable value placed on how we treat one another and our family. The Bible talks all the time about the way that we really love God is by loving the creation and people that he loves, other people. Never more true than the people he's placed in our life to steward really well, which is our family. So we start to wonder, what are the things that only we can do? In fact, I was asked this in a sermon forever ago. I was listening to a sermon, and um, I, someone posed this question. And I'm gonna be honest. Don't tell anybody else this. This is just between us. But um, I usually when someone says something in a sermon, like, hey, go home and do this, and like, write this thing down or journal this thing and light some candles and listen to worship. I just don't do it. I, I, I don't do that. But this one, for some reason, I did. They asked the question, go home and write down what are the things that only you can do? What are the things that only you can do? Make the list. What are the things that only you can do? For some reason, I did it. I went home and I worked on it. And the follow-up challenge was to give it to somebody that you love and trust, that can be honest with you, and tell you how well you did. So I, I gave it to a friend of mine and he looked me, and, and luckily he cared about me enough to be honest, and he said, man, here, here's the reality. There are some things on here that only you can do, but there's a lot of things you wrote on here that you just happen to do better than other people that you think only you can do. There's things on here that you do better than the average bear, so you write it on here because you think I'm really important when I do these things, but if you're honest, other people can do them. And you have to start to wrestle down to the ground what can only I do. And to be honest, only I can be a dad to my daughter, Capri. Only I can be a dad to my daughter, Winter. Only I better be a husband to my wife, Jacqueline. <laughs> better just be me. <laughs> but for you and me, there are very few things that only we can do. And I believe those are the most valuable things with the longest impact in our life. I can't give you the list. But my guess is you're smart enough to figure it out. So as we may be going, maybe a practice for you this week, would you wrestle down? What are the things that only I can do? Let's move on. Point number three, set a clear example. We're supposed to set a clear example. <laughs> I love uh, in our faith and a lot of times in our life, we try and teach a lot of things with our words, but we all know at the end of the day, so much of how we communicate with our family is caught rather than taught. And so the way that we communicate is really convenient and it's great, but being a follower of Jesus should change a lot of our life. Being a follower of Jesus should change the way we communicate. It should change the way we schedule our time. It should change the way we spend our money. It should change the way that we have conversations and it should change the things that we celebrate. In the very beginning, we talked about, as for me and my family, we're gonna serve the Lord, but the easiest litmus test to figure out how we're doing on that is to back reverse engineer it with what are the things that we celebrate as a family? Obviously, you celebrate a lot of noble things like good grades, good behavior, um, following curfew, being kind. All those are all really good. But what God things do you celebrate as a family? What, what characteristics of Jesus, when you see them in somebody else, do you celebrate those as a family? Or do we just celebrate the fact that you were on another select sports team? Is that the priority? Hey, you got great grades again, and that's really the only way that I'm gonna praise you. Or do we start to realize, maybe the Bible makes it pretty clear. In fact, the Bible in Galatians 5 gives us a list of discernible things we can see in other people who are claiming to follow Jesus that, that I think can be praised a lot of times. Here's what we see. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about this from a business perspective. In any organization that you would work at or run, what gets celebrated gets repeated and becomes culture, right? What gets rewarded gets repeated and becomes culture. Same thing is true for your family. What gets celebrated gets repeated and becomes culture. So what's the culture of your family? Do you celebrate kindness, love, patience? Hey, I, I saw that everybody was mad earlier and everyone started to raise their voice and you with a calm voice looked at us he said, maybe we could take a deep breath and everyone could take five minutes and we could talk about this. Or remind us that we all, we're all on the same team. We love each other. That took a lot of self-control. I'm really proud of you for doing that. Wow, now we're creating a culture of following Jesus. Because think about it. As a parent, your kids care more about how you behave than what you talk about. As a, as a husband or wife, your spouse will respect you more 
for the way you behave than your beliefs? As a grandparent, your family will respect you more for the behavior that you demonstrate more than the lectures that you give. Think about it this way. The best families are built through imitation, not information. The best families, they're built through imitation, not just information. So leads me to this next verse in Philippians. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. We're great at this first part. You've learned it, you received it, you heard it. That's usually where we stop. But at the end of the day, you see it in me and then you put it into practice. We all wanna be successful. I know that. I know that about you. Come on. I know you wanna be successful. But what if we started to look at success in a different way? Success is measured by what you do. It's discernible. It's easy. You've accomplished a lot of things. Legacy is measured by what others do in imitation of you. Some of you have settled for being successful, whether it's in your career or life or popularity, whatever it may be. You've settled for being successful when I think God may be calling us to leave a legacy of people who would follow in our footsteps exactly like Joshua called us to do. So you remember the last point, and this is where I'm gonna close. We need to focus on an eternal legacy. And to focus on an eternal legacy, something that goes past simply what we do and how we navigate or what things we accomplish or accumulate, but goes past that. The other day, I was at a memorial for a coworker of mine. And uh, the memorial, I didn't know the guy super well. We'd worked together, and so peripherally, we had a relationship over the water cooler or whatever. It's an older guy, I respect a lot. And uh, I went to his memorial. It's funny what you learn about somebody at a memorial. You learn a lot about their life, a lot deeper than just water cooler conversations. I learned um, that this guy loved to golf, and I was like, wow, man of God, I love that. And uh, he traveled all around the world on these golf trips. He had friends come up, talk about going to Scotland together and showing pictures of all these amazing courses that they've played. I learned that he was an employee of Microsoft for 20 years, and I knew he'd worked there and he was successful, but I didn't know the way he got into Microsoft is Bill Gates personally invited him to head up one of their marketing departments. That's awesome. I, uh, I didn't know that he was a foodie. He loved food, and so when they traveled the world, he ate at all amazing restaurants. And I'm hearing all these stories, and I'm thinking, man, that's what I want. I want to be successful in my career. I want, I want to go on golf trips. I want to eat great food. I want to make memories and have these experiences. And then his kids came up. And his kids started talking about a dad that they respected and loved, that knew, they knew he loved them, that took time, was there, that they felt like a priority. The dad that loved Jesus and modeled that well, and his wife came up afterwards and she started telling his story and I didn't know, and maybe this is a story for some of you in the room too that you can resonate with, but he didn't grow up going to church and wasn't really a Jesus person at all. And it wasn't until he started to be open to what God was doing in a turbulent season and God was a very vague concept to him at the time, but he started going to church. So he became a God person, then kind of like a general church person. And then he became a Jesus follower started to follow Jesus with his life and change his priorities and turn his life upside down and talk to employees at Microsoft, even risking an HR write-up about his faith. And, and I heard a wife just brag on her husband that she loved, that loved her well, that led the family well. And I thought, you know what? Forget the golf trips. Those would be great if we can get them. <laughs> Forget the great food get the cool career where everyone makes me feel important. Those might be just plastic plates after all. But man, I want a family that loves and respects me. Man, I want to be able to look exactly like Joshua said. And you know what? As for me, in my household, we're going to strive to serve the Lord. And it won't be easy and it won't be convenient and we will not get it perfect. Trust me, I will be far from perfect. But we're going to try. So I would just wonder for you, past success, what would legacy look like for you? I'm gonna close in just a second by praying for you. Would you stand to your feet? And I'll just, you can set everything down. You don't need anything right now, but you just bow your head and close your eyes. I'd love to take a moment to pray for you. That's okay.
I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. It just gives you a, a little bit of privacy in a public place like this. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege and responsibility it is to be in a family. Family means a lot of things to a lot of different people in this room, even the people watching online. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would show us what it means to love people like you do. That even in the times where we've gotten it wrong or messed up, where right now, if we're honest, we don't have a legacy we're necessarily proud of, God, would you remind us that there's plenty of time for a rebrand? That starting today, we can decide things will change. It won't happen in a moment or an instant, but Heavenly Father, through your wisdom, through your strength, through your grace, we can have hope for our families. God, I pray for any person in this room who feels so discouraged, feels exhausted and out of place, that don't feel like they have the tools, that they're not equipped and they're not ready. Heavenly Father, would you equip them right now in this moment? Would you begin to bless them? More than just for what it will do for them personally, but God, for a legacy that will go generation after generation. We believe you are up to something spectacular. So Heavenly Father, let us be a part of it. We're so grateful for all that you're doing, and I pray a blessing over every family in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. that would love to pray with you. Otherwise, this is our service. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.